Welcome back everyone to Pontos Fathom Press. This is episode six of the Pontos Fathom podcast. And today we're going to talk about the origins of the Benny Gesserit and other memories in Frank Herbert's Dune. Uh, this is a, the second in our Frank Herbert Dune podcast where we are exploring some of the uh, details of uh, Frank Herbert, uh, his writing, his world building, but also some of the uh, resonances with psychological and even esoteric themes that come out of the Dune book. And maybe one of the reasons why it's such a powerful book and has uh, been remade so many times and uh, has so much interest and even the Expanded Universe books uh, continues to bring more people to this work. So first of all, maybe we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, the Bene Gesserit and the Dune world in general. So spoilers if you haven't read Dune, this is some insights into the backstory of Dune and the world building of Dune. Um, quick, quick note before we start, just want to make a shout out to Dune Revenant. It's our uh, seventh Dune novel fan fiction. Uh, you can check out the link below, really support the channel. and. Uh, you can also help us out by subscribing and liking the video if you do. We also have a Patreon below. Check out our website, www.pontusfathom.com, where you can buy these books and others. And uh, uh, yeah, we really like to hear your comments and suggestions. Looking to make this a live, uh, live podcast once we get uh, some followers. So let's uh, let's talk about Dune and. Uh, Looking forward to your comments below. So we'll start out with some of the backstory of Dune. So Dune takes place, uh, let's say, a roughly 10,000 years in the future. It's after a uh, sort of a diaspora from the Earth. And there's been many different um, changes even to humanity. And I'd even say that some of those changes lead us toward, um, you know, some some ideas about artificial intelligence and also transhumanism you know so the ideas in dune were at some point in the dune history there was something that was called to the butlerian jihad and uh so let's I, i'm just going to read from uh, august moldenhauer's the gearbox giraffe uh where he talks about dune he goes frank herbert's butlerian jihad what are the countermeasures uh to Okay, the backstory of Frank Herbert's Dune universe includes the Butlerian Jihad, the Great Revolt that was an ancient war of humans against their artificial intelligence machine overlords. In Frank Herbert's science fiction classic Dune and throughout the five sequels of his Dune saga, the reader is introduced to a future world with a vast history, which has been described as real as our own. So we're talking about the world building here. If you've already read the book, uh, if you're familiar with Dune or the films, uh, Frank Herbert's Dune, we know that Paul Atreides rises up to become the Muad'Dib. Um, and it's a multi-planet empire uh, in which humanity has left Earth some 10,000 years in the future. So this great revolt is only mentioned marginally through the novels, but its impact is at the core of Herbert's speculative vision. Uh, so the great Re revolt goes by the more popular name in the Dune saga as the Butlerian Jihad. But Herbert's attention to detail in the back history of the universe doesn't stop with this historical war and human victory. The Butlerian Jihad is one of those events that changed the course of human history. You know, something akin to the, uh, the American Civil War and its impact on the ending of uh, African-American slavery, right? So it's sort of like a, this is a war that freed us from the machines, okay? For the Butlerian Jihad redefined all the time as humanity's view of artificial intelligence with the primary commandment of the, what they call the Orange Catholic Bible in the Dune books as, thou shall not make a machine in the likeness of man. So here is Herbert's masterstroke backstory. Really the edict is that man shall not be replaced. And when he says man, he means people, right? Humankind. I mean, it's, you know, it was back before we had the correct use of human. We don't mean man as, as males, we mean humankind we shall not make a machine in the likeness of humans is what really what that means in sort of modern day talk um so let's just talk about 
some of these edicts of the Butlerian Jihad. So we had this kind of revolt against machines, which meant in the backstory that there was a time where machines had grown so powerful that humans had to revolt against them. So this idea of you cannot replace humans and you cannot create a machine in the likeness of a human led to some very interesting things. Now, just a quick note on this Butlerian Jihad. Where does the name come from? I know in the Dune Saga, they say, I believe in the appendix here, we might, we might be able to get some hints from it. Uh, if we look up the Butlerian Jihad in Dune, we say, see Jihad Butlerian, also Great Revolt. So let's look at the Great Butlerian Jihad. The crusade against computers, thinking machines, and conscious ro robots that began in the year 201 before Guild and concluded in 108 before Guild. Its chief commandment of the Orange Catholic Bible is, thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of a human mind. Right? So this is very interesting, right? And then we have the Great Revolt is another interest. Uh, the Great Revolt, the common turn for the Butlerian Jihad. So that's literally 10,000 years ago. So whatever Earth history led us to the rise of the machines, then we had the Great Revolt against the machines. And that starts 100 years before the Guild. And who is the Guild? Well, the Guild is the Spacing Guild, which learned to fold space. So this is where space travel really begins to flourish. Now we're doing it totally with human means. So let's go back to the name again. Uh, in, in Dune lore, uh, some say that there is a, I think in the, the old Dune encyclopedia, I'm not sure if that's canon anymore, but that used to say that uh, Jenna or Genna, Jenna Butler, Jenna Butler was the lead revolutionary in the Butlerian Jihad. But there's an interesting person in history that Frank Herbert may have been influenced by. And I'll just show you this face here from the laptop. This is Samuel Butler. Samuel Butler was a English uh, writer. Um, and he wrote a novel in 1872 called Erewhon uh, that was called Darwin Against the Machines or subtitled Darwin Against the Machines. So interestingly enough, in Butler's Erewhon, we have some some um, resonances with um, with this. So in Butler's Erewhon, he kind of speculates the idea of a uh, a time where uh, an encounter with a people who no longer use machines, because they uh, so these Erewhon, they had a book called the Book of the Machines. And it was kind of this weird idea of tech question of technology. So, so the question of machines in Erewhon starts immediately when Higgs, the character, arrives in the hidden society. And the first people he meets are acting strangely because he has a pocket watch. And in the book of machines, they've preserved machines as a warning for humans to not let the machines take over. So they've moved beyond this. Now, what, what replaces the machines um, in the Dune universe is these schools of thought. And I, I just pulled out these cards from the, from the Dune board game just so that we can use, the, use them as visuals here. But we have the Spacing Guild. First of all, we just mentioned the Spacing Guild. They use the spice of Dune to fold space. So they, not, they, don't, they don't rely on computers to fold space time. They actually use the spice trance to be able to see the navigation to travis, tra traverse the universe. So let's say... So the spice becomes the replacement for a transhuman group called the Spacing Guild. Then we have uh, another such group, which are the Tlilaxu. Now the Tlilaxu also, they, have, they are training mentats and face dancers. So what's a mentat? A mentat is a spice enhanced, um, spiced enhanced human, again, sort of a transhuman in which they are able to think like a human. So, so the first indication of the Tlilaxu are their building of the Tlilaxu mentats. So these mentat schools, right? So what, what replaced human, what replaced thinking machines? Human calculators. So they actually uh, were able to develop the human mind to the point where they're able to take 
over all those roles that computers used to use. Now people could do that, or the specially trained people could do that in their own minds. So you have this idea of now the human is surpassed the AI. The human is like the AI now, right? The, the human has these powers. And then thirdly, we've got another group uh, in here that kind of fits as well, which is the Bene Gesserit, right? And we, 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 we introduced the talk of the Bene Gesserit. Now, who are the Bene Gesserit? The Bene Gesserit, another spice enhanced school. Um, so the Bene Gesserit, it was a sisterhood in, in Dune. It's only uh, female members of the Bene Gesserit. And we can read about it in Herbert's glossary again. Uh, if we look up Bene Gesserit, it says, the Bene Gesserit, an ancient school of mental and physical training established primarily for female students after the Butlerian Jihad destroyed the so-called thinking machines and robots, right? And now one of the things that the Bene Gesserit are involved with is a breeding program to create a superhuman that's called the Quetzal's Heterach. So the Quetzal's Heterach, the shortening of the way, this is the label applied by the Bene Gesserit to the unknown for which they sought a genetic solution, a male Bene Gesserit whose organic mental powers would bridge space and time. So very interesting. There's also a, a um, report of the Bene Gesserit here in the Dune Appendix. Uh, I believe it's in Appendix 3. It says, report on the Bene Gesserit, motives and purpose. So the Bene Gesserit, uh, because the Bene Gesserit operated for centuries uh, in their breeding program of the Quetzal's Haderach, they detected Paul Muad'Dib, oh, who is Paul Atreides, and they saw that he had a power to be a uh, prescient, which means he had the ability to predict the future. And he defied four-dimensional explanation, they call it. Now, one thing that's interesting is the Bene Gesserit have a number of powers, if we call them that. The Bene Gesserit, they are able to not only practice truth-saying, which they can they can tell if someone is speaking the truth or not. They at times have the power of limited prophecy and they at times have the ability, well not at times, when they become Reverend Mothers, which is a elevated state of a Bene Gesserit sister who rises up and then takes the spice to transform herself to a sort of the high priestess of the Bene Gesserit they're able to know all of their ancestral memories. Now this is a very powerful world building technique and topic that, that uh, Herbert uses, right? So the idea of the Bene Gesserit's other memory, they call it, uh, the other memory is that which the Bene Gesserit use to know all of their ancestors. And that other memory comes across um, as uh, a very powerful tool in human intelligence because now that they have um, now that they have other memory they're also able to follow this multi-generational plan of improving the humans and uh, very powerfully written in the books now in the biography uh, in the biography that uh, Brian Herbert writes about uh, Frank Herbert. Biography says, where did this other memory idea come from? So the other memory idea, um, and, and he speculates uh, in, and I think it's a great speculation, and, and on some levels I think it's an adequate spe uh, speculation. Um, he speculates that because Frank Herbert was influenced by a psychologist, Carl Jung, that this is where Frank Herbert drew a lot of his inspiration from. But I've got a, a new theory that I'd like my research has sort of uncovered, and it'll link us back to the Butlerian Jihad. So, so on the one hand, we have, let's just kind of go through the Duneverse. Let's do a quick summary before we get into, into uh, Dune. So 
in the, in the one hand, we have these schools of enhanced thinkers, the Spacing Guild, the Tlilaxu, and the Bene Gesserit. They all use spice. And in rebellion to the machines, humans have become enhanced. Let's write a frame here. Humans have become advanced um, in place of machines. But we also have the Ixians. The Ixians somehow are allowed to defy some of those Butlerian Jihad um, edicts to ban thinking machines. So the Ixians are sort of a black market broker of machines. So we have the Beni Tlilaxu, we have the, uh, the Tlilaxu, which not only have Mentats, but they have one other feature, which is called the Gola. And the Gola is like a clone that they can bring back to life. And this is gonna be very important to the other memory topic that we're gonna talk about. And then we have the spacing go that they can fold space. And then we sort of have normal power structures. You know, we have the emperor, right? We have the emperor. We have the houses, you know, the, of the Landsrad. We have the Harkonnens and the Atreides. And they're following more like the political side of Frank Herbert. So Frank Herbert's following politics. There's a galactic empire. There's various houses that are influenced. And then these groups, the Spacing Guild, the Twilax, the Bene Gesserit, and the Ixians, they sort of are working different parts of the mercantile religion. Uh, they're very intricate in the society. And then you have this wild card that comes up, the Fremen. Right? The Fremen kind of are, are between both sides. And, and if you know Dune's story, you'll kind of understand what I'm talking about. But we'll get back to this, okay? Let's jump into the influence of the Bene Gesserit from, a psych, from Carl Jung. Now, we, we, we know that there's a name kind of like the Bene Gesserit. If we, if we say the Jesuits, the Christian organization, the Jesuits, that may kind of serve as a inspiration for the Bene Gesserit, Jesuits because the Jesuits were throughout European history, at least, um, moving forward with knowledge and, and, and were behind many secular, although they were a religious order, they were also uh, able to help integrate uh, scientific knowledge into the slow-moving church. And one of the powers of the, or one of the, one of the missions of the Bene Gesserit, they also manipulate religion. So in their breeding programs, not only are they looking to breed this superhuman, this Quetzalcoatl Heterok, but they're also keeping an eye on planets by sparking up cults here, having some religions there. So they are kind of very influential in the religious experience of the empire of the Dune universe. So to show that Bene Gesserit's power of ancestral memory, which they call other memory or ancestral memory, and the way it works basically is when the Bene Gesserit mother, Reverend Mother, takes the water of life from the sandworm, her consciousness is able to remember the ancestral memories, but only on the female side back through history and only up to the age of the childbirth of the ancestor. So the idea is say if your mother had you, so say you are a female Bene Gesserit, your mother had you when she was say 30 years old. So when you awaken, you will have your mother's memories up to her 30th year in full detail as if they're your own memories. And then you'll also have your grandmother's memory, your mother's mother's memory as her memories up to, so you say your grandmother had you when she was 25. So you'll have your mother's memories up to when she was 30, your grandmother's memories up to when she gave birth to your mother, and so on and so forth, all the way back through history. Now this is a phenomenal science fiction idea that Her Herbert comes up with. And, and as I was mentioning in the, in, the, in the Brian Herbert biography, he speculates it has to do a, a somewhat, and I, and I agree with it to a, a degree, and it's a great explanation, to uh, Jung's collective unconscious. So let's switch gears. What's the collective unconscious of Jung? Jung's collective unconscious is a similar idea. So let's just think of it just quickly to kind of fast track it. Those of you who know, I'll do my best. 
Uh, so Jung's uh, collective unconscious, let's just say that there are human roles that we see in myth, in family, in narratives, in crises, right? We have the warriors at war. We have mothers and fathers. We have lovers. We have betrayals. We have heartbreak. We have young love. We have so many of this father-son relation, the mother-daughter relation, the mother-son relation, the father-son relation, the hero to the tribe relation, the, you know, the, the, the horrors of war, the things that go bump in the night, the looking out into the darkness, the near-death experience, um, the stranger who arrived in town one day. All of these kind of archetypal stories have been a human thing for millennia. So whenever we're born, we automatically have, a, have parents, right? And so that parent role is something that we react to. And we've been reacting to that through all of time. So what Jung found in his, that was my best shot at that. So what Jung found in the collective unconscious is that we're not so different from each other across cultures and across uh, human endeavors in that we all participate in these ideas. So the, our ancestors have been through wars. Our, our ancestors have been children. Our, our ancestors have been mothers and fathers. Our ancestors have been sons and daughters all the way back through history, right? Some of them have been cowardly. Some of them have been heroic. Some of them died from a sacrifice. Someone lived old with regrets. You know, there's all these kind of, some have been beautiful. Some have been, uh, 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 crones, right? Some have been strong and athletic. Others have been old and feeble. Like all of these myths encapsulate all of our human ancestors. You know, you could go in your own family history and think back, you know, what, what was my grand grandfather's life like? What was my great grandfather's life like? What was my great grandmother's life like? And then you think, well, what about my great, great, great grandmother's life? And as we speculate on these, Jung kind of titrated out from this some patterns that are, are, are linked to what he called the collective unconscious. And you can see there is intuitively a lot there within the Bene Gesserit other memory. There's a lot of details in the Bene Gesserit other memory that kind of seem like Jung's collective unconscious. Except when we go back to this person, Samuel Butler. So we know Samuel Butler for his Butlerian Jihad, right? So we talked about the rise up against the machines. But what may not be as famously known, Samuel Butler wrote another book. Uh, Samuel Butler, so he's writing in the 1800s, and he was a critic somewhat of, of um, Darwin, but not the way you think. So he wasn't like a creationist thinker for, for necessarily. But he was a scientific thinker, but he was a very mind-blowing scientific thinker. So again, uh, uh, Butler's work Erewhon, sort of a satirical, like a, in the tradition of a Gulliver's Travels or something like this, was a call out to the idea of machines taking over from humans, right? And we see in, in Butler's writing of Erewhon, he talked about, uh, one of his arguments in Erewhon was the future of machines uh, one is that machines become an extension of the human and they're almost like an extra limb or another part of the body, right? His second argument is that the extensions will eventually become more powerful than the body. So the body will just be the appendage of the machines. And so the idea of the machines outpacing us has been around for... I mean, literally since the rise of the Industrial Revolution. So you, so you sort of see uh, Herbert had reacted to Butler's writings of Erewhon in his Butlerian Jihad. But, and, and while Herbert for sure is influenced by Jung, Butler's other book is what, we, what, we've re, what our research has sort of revealed here. So I want to talk a little bit about this. So in, in Butler's book, uh, unconscious memory. 
So a Butler writes, uh, in 1870 and 1871, I was writing Erewhon, and I thought the best way to look at machines was to see them as limbs, which we had made and carried about with us, or left at home in pleasure. I was not satisfied by, th by this, and, and I had already finished, and I returned to the old subject. And continuously, as other businesses would allow, I proposed to myself to see not only machine as limbs, but also as limbs as machines. I felt immediately that I was upon firmer ground. I used, the use of the word organ for a limb told its very own story. The word could not have become so current under this meeting unless the idea of a limb as a tool or a machine had come to agreeable and common sense. What would follow then if we regarded our limbs and organs as things that we ourselves had manufactured for our conveniences? Right, so very interesting. And he goes on to say, the first question that suggested itself was, how did we come to make them without knowing anything about them? And this raised another, namely, another question, namely, how come, any, how come any, anybody can do anything unconsciously? And the answer of habit did not seem fair. Can a person be said to do a thing by force of habit or routine when his ancestors and not he had done it in the past. Not unless he and his ancestors are the same person. So again, this is Butler speculating on human memory, ancestral memory. Perhaps they are not the same person after all. What is sameness? I remember Bishop Butler's sermon on personal identity. We read it again and saw very plainly that if a man of 80 may consider himself identical with the baby that he had developed from, so that he may say, I am a man who at six months old this, did this or that, then the baby may just as fairly claim identity with its father and mother and say to its parents, I'm being born, I was only you a few months ago. But parity of reasoning, each living form now on earth must be able to claim identity with generations of its ancestors up to the primordial cell inclusive. Again, if the octogenarian may claim personal identity with the infant, the infant may certainly do so with the impregnate ovum from which it developed. So if the octogenarian would prove to have been a fish once in his prior life, this is like he was living yesterday. So here we have the seeds. And his book, Unconscious Memory, goes on to explore this insane idea. What's the linkage between our biological evolutionary biology and our memory biology. And again, this is very much explored in the later Dune books with the character of Duncan Idaho. So what do we have Duncan Idaho? So again, Duncan Idaho uh, was a loyal Atreides who, who was killed in the Harkonnen raid uh, that toppled Duke Leto and sent Paul and Jessica fleeing to the desert. The uh, Duncan Idaho in the sequel to Dune, Dune Messiah, is reanimated by the Tlilaxu, right? So uh, Dune Messiah, there's a conversation between Paul and this Gola. So Duncan Idaho is reborn as a Gola called Hayet. And Paul speaks almost in a platonic ideal. He calls a plastic form of Duncan Idaho separate from the Gola flesh. He mentions that the ancients probed into this area before the Butlerian Jihad. What is he referring to? The Gola Hayet is a Tlilaxu experiment in trying to awaken cellular ancestral memories, concepts that have been one of the most compelling in Herbert's novels. As the reverend mothers of the Bene Gesserit were able to awaken their ancestral memories from the female line through breeding, training in the properties of the spice melange, the Tlilaxu sought to manufacture a similar, similar awakening of cellular memories using bioengineering and trauma-based mind control techniques and genetic ma manipulation. So this is where they get the, the, the nickname the Dirty Tlilaxu, right? So the Dirty Tlilaxu would be, you know, the Tlilaxu, you know, they're using these ax axolotl tanks, which are actually genetic birthing chambers based on like genetically stunted members of, of the human race, right? So they're using humans as birthing units to create clones. And then they experiment with Duncan Idaho 
to actually create a gola that remembers, that awakens the memory. So they're, it's almost like the Tlilaks who are competing with the Bene Gesserit, who have other memory. The Bene Gesserit do other memory through a more of a mystical genetic way where they use melange and a natural sort of process to awaken the female line. But the Tlilaks who want to use a genetic way. Now, where does this come from? It doesn't seem like that's what Jung's talking about. Like, I mean, Jung's talking about a collective unconscious, a, a familial patterns of humanity, you know, archetypes of humanity. That Yes, we all have these archetypes in common. But Butler clearly is talking about, is it possible that there is some genetic memory? Now, there's been some experiments. I think Butler goes into some of them. The idea of, I think they use, and this is the real clincher. Like when I read this, I was like, no way. This cannot be true. There were experiments done with worms. Worms of all things, right? Why worms? So there's experiments done with worms in which the worms are trained by some stimuli not to do something, sort of like a Pavlovian reaction, okay? So they'll get a shock or something. I don't know the exact experiment, but there was an experiment in, involving worms and the worms would learn not to approach a certain thing and to approach another thing because of some kind of Pavlovian kind of pain, pleasure response. They knew where to go you know, for the food and where not to go from, for the pain thing. Now, they found that after a, a number of generations of worms, the worms were born knowing the difference between the Pavlovian experiment. So something of the experiment you know, maybe it's an epigenetic kind of phenomenon. Who knows how it's explained? I don't know how it's been explained by science recently. Hey, if you guys know, please leave a link below uh, that, or, or leave a uh, comment below. But you know, back in, in Samuel Butler's time, Samuel Butler's time, he was exploring some of these offshoots of the you know, this uh, this mind blowing Darwinian research. So I believe that Frank Herbert may have been influenced. Not only the Bene Gesserit are influenced by Jungian, for sure. There's a Jungian angle. There's a Jesuit angle for the Bene Gesserit, but also from Samuel Butler again. So Samuel Butler's unconscious memory shows up in the Bene Gesserit's other memory. It shows up in the Tlilaxu Gola program, which becomes a huge phenomenon in the um, Dune saga. And, um, and it also shows uh, the kind of secret sauce of Frank Herbert's inspiration that a lot of this comes out of these, you know, 18th century thinkers that were already warning us about these transhuman and AI type concerns. And I guess I'll leave it with, a, you know, the final kind of note of Dune, which, you know, comes back to the wild card, you know. So if we looked again at, you know, you've got Ixians keeping the machines, you know, they're like the tech giants today. You've got the Bene Gesserit with the breeding programs. You've got the Tlilaxu with their human computers. You've got the Spacing Guild using spice to fold space. You've got the Harkonnens and the Atreides playing by the rules of the empire. But then you have a strange thing that happens because you've got the Bene Gesserit sort of playing both sides and then the Fremen sort of overlapping with the Atreides. And then you have Paul kind of emerges at the, at the root of this, where it's sort of like the wildness of the Fremen, who are the spice, right? And it becomes a circle, right? It becomes a mandala, which for sure is a Jungian influence, right? So you have the idea of uh, empire and spirit. You've got the, the, the axis of uh, human and superhuman. And you've got the, the, the axis of the Fremen and their wild card. But also we have this other axis because the Atreides also end up being kind of the Fremen later. And you've got this kind of Harkonnen Spacing Guild, Tolilaxu Ixian. You've got something like this going on, right? This fourfold view of things. Let me try to make this clearer. So you have at the axis, the Atreides, noble, and the Fremen, wild. You've got the Harkonnen, 
corrupt and evil, right? And you've got the Ixians, forbidden technology. You've got the Bene Tlilaks and the Bene Gesserit, transhumanists. And you've got the politics of the Spacing Guild and the Emperor. So it sort of forms a bit of a Jungian mandala. So I, I, you know, I think that it's fair to go with uh, the influences of Dune and Frank Herbert's Bene Gesserit and uh, the Butlerian Jihad. Uh, a lot of these are heroic stories that are very Jungian. A lot of it is un uh, collective unconscious. Um, but there is a huge debt to Samuel Butler and something I'm going to be doing some more research on. So uh, if you guys are interested with what we've done today, uh, please like and subscribe. I'll be doing another podcast about Dune, about world building, uh, and uh, also can check out Gearbox Giraffe by August Moldenhauer. It talks about these topics, uh, Dune Revenant. Would love to hear your comments below um, and join our Patreon. And thanks for watching and hope this was interesting. Uh, let me know what you think and stay tuned next week for our next uh, podcast. I'll talk to you all later. Thanks. Bye-bye.